Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Peter Skaggs with Lighthouse, and I want to thank you for joining me on episode number seven of the Lifestyle Asset Podcast. Today, we're going to go through the two options that you have when financing or when considering financing a lifestyle asset. So let's jump right into it. So as I mentioned right there at the get-go, there are principally two options when it comes to financing your lifestyle asset. The first is that we can buy it as a second home or vacation home. And the second is that we can buy it as an investment property. The principal difference is that for the property to qualify as a second home, you have to meet a few specific uh, criteria when it comes to financing it through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and most of the non-qualified mortgage or non-QM lenders. Uh, the, those I've got those guidelines right here. Basically, it says that when we are buying this as a second home, we must uh, we must occupy the the property must be occupied by the borrower for some portion of the year. Usually, that uh, is fourteen days total in a year. That can be a few weekends. That can be fourteen days in a row. Uh, it could be two weeks, uh, whatever it takes, but ultimately 14 days is usually the check. Uh, you must occupy that property, uh, intend to occupy that property for at least 14 days out of the year. It is, uh, when buying it as a second home, we're restricted to a one unit dwelling, meaning it can only be a single family or a condo or a town home. We cannot buy a multifamily, a duplex, triplex, fourplex when we, when we finance it as a second home. It also has to be suitable for year-round occupancy. You cannot buy a, a, a place like maybe some hotels will say, hey, during the season, you cannot use your property, but out of season, you can use it as much as you want. That's not allowed when we buy it as a second home. You have It has to be suitable for year-round occupancy. You can go use it anytime you want. Doesn't mean you're going to use it. Doesn't mean you have to use it. It just simply means it is suitable for and available to you for year round. The borrower must have exclusive control over the property, meaning you have the ability to dictate when you're in and out of that property. And uh, it must not be a rental property or timeshare, meaning you don't have a long term agreement or you're not you know, doing a fractional. You're, you're, you own the property outright. So those are a few of the requirements when it comes to buying it as a second home over what you might see when it buying it as an investment property. Now, I want to go through, we kind of went through that a little bit there, but I want to go through some pros and cons to both options. Uh, I want to show you a few of them, but uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list. It does change when we jump from a conventional financing to a jumbo or to a non-QM. So uh, please use these as a basic guideline if you're just in your decision making but ultimately we'll want to get you pre-qualified or pre-approved to help you determine which route is the right one for you. So uh, first I want to talk about the pros and cons to invest you uh, buying it as a second home. So the first pro to buying it as a second home is that you can use gift funds for your down payment. So you don't have to have the money on hand. You could get money from a spouse. You could get money from a loved one, a family member, uh, you could get love from, or excuse me, gifts, gift funds from a, uh, a loved one like an uncle or an aunt or somebody like that. You can get gift funds to help you with the down payment for your second home. That's a pro. Another pro for buying it as a second home is that we don't have to put as much down. We can put as little as 10% down when buying it as a second home. 10%. What, if, if you know investing in real estate, leverage is a powerful tool, and this allows you to get more leverage. Uh, it can be a very, very cool thing. So instead of buying one property with 20% down, maybe you buy two properties, 10% down each. Interest rates will change, other terms will change, but that is a cool, uh, that is a, a pro to buying it as a second home. The other one to buying as a second home is that you can get more in seller concessions. I'm gonna go through that here in a second. But basically, you can get the seller to pay your closing costs, to pay all of your escrows, uh, and they can give you additional funds to buy down your interest rate, to pay points or to pay origination, to pay those things so that you can get a lower interest rate 
when it comes to buying a second home because you can get those seller concessions. Now, some of the negatives, the cons to buying it as a second home. When you buy it as a second home, it is your second home. You, you're not limited in how many second homes, but there are some limitations. Call us and we can guide you through that. But ultimately, uh, when you buy it as a second home, they are qualifying you based on your income. You are buying the, uh, the debt, you're buying the mortgage, you are not buying the income. We are using this as a second home. We have to have control of it. We have to be occupying it for some period of time. Uh, we have to have access to it year round. And so as a result of that, as a result of that, uh, we could be carrying two mortgages, our primary residence and our second home. And so as a result, uh, it can impact, will impact our debt to income ratio. So we've got to make sure we qualify. Uh, and that's going to be the job of a good loan officer to help you with that. There is also a distance requirement when buying it as a second home. I could not buy my neighbor's home as a second home. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, there, the distance requirements, Fannie and Freddie basically do not have a set specific requirement. They just simply say it has to make sense to the underwriter as far as the distance. Um, so a perfect example of this is I helped a client buy a home up in Heber. They lived in Salt Lake. Here in Utah, and I help them buy up in Heber, 20 miles maybe, maybe 25 miles from them, uh, and and so just not a significant distance. But Heber is very much a um, a uh, resort destination. Uh, I would love to buy a place in in uh, in Sundance. You're talking 15, 20 miles from my house, maybe even less than that. And uh, and and I could qualify for a second home there in Sundance because it's a resort destination. But ultimately, it has to make sense. Again, I couldn't buy my neighbor's home. I couldn't buy a home probably in Provo or Orem, which are just south of me. Uh, I couldn't. I likely couldn't buy something maybe even in Payson. Uh, I would have to go some distance out. Usually, the general idea is that 20, 25 miles or more uh, on that. So that's a con. It's a hoop that you have to jump through. Now, when it comes to pros and cons of financing it as an investment home, some of the pros are we get to use the rental income. That rental income is going to help us qualify for more, more house, because we now have income being added to uh, added to what we're using to our principal income, our, our day job. And so that that is going to allow us to qualify for more house. We also can use what's called a debt service coverage ratio or a debt service coverage option. Uh, what this means is basically why well, can use the rents to offset the mortgage payment, and it opens up all sorts of financing options. If I had, as an example, a $3,000 mortgage, as long as I could rent it for $3,000 on a monthly basis, that $3,000 is a one-to-one -one ratio with the new mortgage payment of 3,000, and as a result, I could get financing, and I don't need to show employment in, or, or, or income, as long as I can just show that the rents are gonna cover the mortgage. That's a really, really cool option. Also, uh, this has already kind of been stated in, in, um, in essence by those other two, but the DTI, our DTI is often not impacted, or if it is, it's very, very, very insignificantly impacted because a debt to income ratio has two sides of that same coin. It has a debt side and an income side. When we buy it as an investment property, we're getting both the debt and the income. And as a result, if the, as long as the income the, the rents offset the debt or more than offset the debt, it should not impact our debt to income ratio. What that means for us is that it allows us to buy more and more and more investment properties. We can go finance 10 properties, uh, maybe maybe even more than that, uh, because we have a, a good debt to income ratio. Our debt to income ratio is not being impacted by carrying a bunch of mortgages without the income aspect. Hopefully that makes sense. The Some of the cons to buying it as an investment property is that more is more is required for a down payment. Usually you have to do 15% down on a single family. Uh, most people put 20% down because the rates are in better, uh, but you can do as little as 15% down compared to a second home where you only have to do 10% down. Also more reserves are typically required when uh, financing it as a second, or excuse me, as an investment property. Usually you have to show six months of uh, mortgage payments available to you in some sort of reserve account so that uh, you can show to the lender that, hey, if your tenants were to leave or you had some other issues that you have money uh, set aside for reserves. Also, 
sellers can only give you up to 2% of the purchase price for concessions. Uh, as an example, if I were buying a $400,000 property, I would be limited to 2% of that, $8,000 in seller concessions from the seller if I'm financing it as an investment property. Versus if I finance it as a second home, I could get 3%, 6%, or 9% depending on uh, how much down I am putting. So this is a, a little bit of a, a pro tip here. And I'm going to give you two pro tips. The first is just what I just outlined. When financing it as a second home, you can, if you put 10% or more down, you can get actually 6% towards closing costs. Uh, now, you uh, closing costs guys are not gonna cost a full 6% of the purchase price. So again, if you're buying a $400,000 property, that's $24,000. Closing costs are not gonna be anywhere near that. Uh, they're probably, in most states, in most cases, you're probably like 1%. Uh, maybe four thousand dollars for title and uh and for uh, your appraisal and for your lender fees those kinds of things maybe it's a little more a little less depending on the purchase price and the area the state and, and the county that you're in but it's not going to be anywhere near six so you say well why peter then would i get six percent uh well the reason you'd get six percent is because you can use the other percentage to pay origination to buy down the interest rate to pay discount points to pay for your escrows to prepay tax insurance, to prepay taxes, to pre prepay your uh, homeowner's insurance. Those kinds of things can be used, uh, that 5% that can be used to pay those things. So it's gonna allow you to get a much, much better interest rate. Now, most loan officers, if I was to ask them how much they could get in seller concessions on a second home, mo or even a primary residence, most of them are gonna tell you 3%. 3% is the case if you're putting less than 10% down. Uh, if you are doing uh, anywhere from 10 to 25% down, you can actually get 6% in seller concessions. Uh, and those concessions can pay realtor fees. They can pay for a, a number of things. They just cannot pay your down payment. Then if you put 25% or more down, you can actually get 9% in seller concessions. Now, there are other limiting factors. There are tests that we have to go through to, for it to be a qualified mortgage. But as long as you pass those tests, you can get as much as 9% of the purchase price towards closing costs uh, to help you in buying down your interest rate, to help you with uh, all sorts of, you know, any other costs to maybe you want to add earthquake insurance. Maybe you want to add some other benefits uh, to, 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 as you're financing this property. Uh, another, the second pro tip goes in alignment with that. I always recommend that first, the first lever we pull when negotiating with the seller is to get seller concessions first. Then we negotiate after we've maxed that out, after we've gotten our three, six or 9%, depending on how much down we're putting. Once we've done that, then we go and drop the purchase price. Uh, it is natural tendency to want to drop the purchase price first. Of course, we want to buy a property for zero money. And of course, we want a 0% interest rate, right? But ultimately, that's not realistic. Instead of going from a $400,000 property down to a 390, I would rather you get $10,000 in concessions and keep it at 400,000. Why? Because you can use that $10,000 to buy down your interest rate. You're going to have a better monthly payment, a lower monthly payment by getting $10,000 in concessions and buying down the interest rate than you will by dropping the purchase price. Now, if you can, we wanna max out the seller concessions and then start negotiating our purchase price down. And I am a big fan of both of those levers. You should pull on both of those levers, uh, depending on the market, depending on what the home, depending on all sorts of factors. Um, but ultimately, I'm a big fan of both of those levers. But the first lever we always pull is the seller concessions. Let's get a better interest rate, a lower interest rate, and then we'll go and negotiate the purchase price second. I hope that was helpful. I hope that was good information for you. Uh, again, I am Peter Skaggs. I'm with Lighthouse, uh, and, uh, and, and I, I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope you found today's episode helpful. Uh, the greatest asset you have is your time. I hope you received a high ROI with your time today with me. Uh, if you'd like more information, please check us out at 
I am a lighthouse.com. That is I am a lighthouse.com. That's I'm a lighthouse.com. Uh, you can find us there. If you would like to get pre approved or pre qualified, call or text me at 801 664 1079. 801 664 1079. Text me and we can get you scheduled so we can get you pre-approved. We can discuss which option is going to be best for you, how much down, how much closing costs, help we should be asking for, what your monthly payments are, et cetera, et cetera. We would love to do that for you. We're the best in the business at it. So uh, I thank you again for joining us. And remember, a legacy isn't left, it's lived. Have a blessed day.